When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Everybody say question. And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some say Elias, other Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom say you that I am? Verse 16, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Everybody say it with me. Say, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Verse 18, And I say unto you that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Everybody say, the gates of hell shall not prevail. Against the church. Jesus promised to build this church not on any one person or individual other than himself. Building the church up on himself. But on the truth of Peter and the other disciples' bold confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Powerful words there. Who are you? You are Jesus, the Son of the living God. Everybody say powerful statement. Revealed by the Father. Now watch this. Verse 16. Peter states, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. On the truth of Peter and the disciples' bold confession that Jesus is the Son of the living God, Jesus calls Peter one of his disciples. He calls him Petros, meaning a small stone. The church is built on Peter's solid confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Savior of the world. It is Jesus who is the rock, the steady, and the sure foundation of the church, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. Peter writes in 1 Peter that Jesus is the living stone, a chief cornerstone, the stone which the builders rejected, 1 Peter 2, verse 4, verses 6 and 7. At the same time, Peter and all the other disciples, followers of Christ, servants of Christ, are also living stones who become a part of the structure of the house. Everybody say, the house that God builds. How many of you want to be in the house that God builds? Lift your hand real high. The house that God builds, the church. Oh, listen, everybody say the church. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, the house that God builds. You and I are representatives of Christ. Just as the church was founded on a bold confession of Jesus' authority, the church continues to advance. No matter what anybody says, the church continues to advance through the gospel message. The gospel message continues to progress and take territory because of the power and the authority of Jesus that was displayed, continued through his disciples. The Bible says the gates of hell shall not prevail. In this passage, the gates of hell may mean the powers of death. It may mean that. If study, you will see that. In a broader, more extensive sense, it likely refers to Satan and all the forces of evil in the world opposed to Jesus Christ and his kingdom. This scripture is not meant to describe the church in a defensive posture. Everybody say, we are not on the defense. This scripture is not meant to describe the church in a defensive posture, as if the church is simply holding up under attack. How many of you heard what I'm saying? How many of you hear what I'm saying? Because we're going somewhere. Everybody say the church. Say, I'm part of the church. This passage of scripture, this knowledge, is not a description of the gates of hell coming against the church. This passage describes the church on the offense, actively coming against gates of hell, strong spiritual walls of Satan's kingdom. The gates of Satan's area of control will not be able to hold back or stand up against the church as it reclaims territory, meaning territory, meaning human lives rescuing people from the power of death. In the end, nothing can stop the power of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ from accomplishing and fulfilling God's purposes. Are you in the church? 
the house that God has built. Mark, it's good to see you here this morning. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap for what God's done in Mark's body. Thank you, Jesus. Now watch this. Nothing can stop the church from accomplishing and fulfilling God's purpose and plans here on earth. Nothing will be able to stop the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, understand the goal of the church is not the church itself. Here we go. Well, what is the goal of the church? The kingdom. The goal of the church is the kingdom. I watch everybody say the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is the goal of the church. The church is the conduit, is the channel for conveying, for transmission, the action of transmitting something. God will establish God's will, God's will establishing God's will, the church. We are the conduit, the channel. We are carriers of the kingdom of God, those that establish God's will through his kingdom. Somebody said, how in the world does that happen? Luke chapter 17, verse 20 and 21, something we don't talk about. The kingdom of God does not come through observation, but the kingdom of God, when you receive Christ, comes into you. Now, I am a carrier of the kingdom of God, and wherever, how many of you hear what I'm saying? And wherever I go, I serve the world, the kingdom. I serve them the kingdom of God. Listen, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. His kingdom has come and takes up resident in us. And if his kingdom is resident in us, then his will is to be served. And wherever his will is served, his kingdom is established. Everybody shout, taking territory. Now watch this. I want you to see it. If you're with me so far, say yes because we're building towards something. Jesus, in a conversation with his buddies, the Pharisees, they said, when will the kingdom of God come? Jesus said, the kingdom of God doesn't come with observation, signs to be observed or with visible display. People will not say, here is the kingdom of God over here, come over here, or see it over there, there's the kingdom of God over there. It says it's not going to come, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. How many of you getting this? Say yes. Everybody say, in me. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is spiritual, not material or political. We are talking about your inner man, a change from the inside out, not with observation. It doesn't come with an earthly political power. You are a material political power. You cannot gain a place in the kingdom of God by your own efforts. Listen now. Going somewhere. Becoming a part of the kingdom of God requires a completely changed heart and mind that only God can produce as we yield, everybody say yield, our lives to him. God's kingdom concepts, God's kingdom purpose, God's kingdom agenda begins to develop on the inside of you and I through a process called sanctification. It says in the book of Romans that you and I, God's main objective is to conform and transform you and I into the image of his son Jesus. Everybody say, following Jesus. Now, when you follow Jesus, you will be tempted. And when you start compromising, you hear what I'm saying? Listen now. Have I ever been following Jesus and got off track? Look at me. Yes. But the things that I used to get off track on, I don't know more because I've been through the... How can you follow Jesus and end up in the bed of adultery? Did Jesus leave you there? No, he didn't lead you there. You were tempted and you, how many of you hear what I'm saying? Everybody say, yield to Jesus, not to temptation. I'm going to say something here. Now watch. As Kat and I traveled, saw it all over the United States, what I'm talking about right now. Saw it. And then the Lord said, now see it in you. I want you to see some things in you, Tim, 
Stop looking at other people and look at yourself. Now, I'm talking about when God has told me I'm pleased with you. But listen, if my father wants to make alterations and adjustments, he can. How many of you let daddy do that? Lift your hand real high and shout yes. Okay, now watch. Stay with me. Watch. The power of God's kingdom is shown through the church, you and I, conquering and established victory over sin, sickness, disease, and over Satan and his schisms and schemes. Wherever God's kingdom is established, his will is served. Everybody say, becoming a part of the kingdom. The church is a mighty moving force. The redeemed, the church, those who have been blood-bought, purchased with the blood of Jesus, and have accepted Jesus as Savior, following Jesus in example in life and or death if need be. Prisoners held in captivity by the powers of darkness are being freed. Bondages are falling beneath our feet as we boldly confess he is the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, behold, I give unto you power to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing by any means shall harm or hurt you. I read that and then I go back and I look at Paul and Silas. Nothing by any means shall harm or hurt me. But though, listen, they were taken to a whipping post and beaten. They were thrown into prison. The prisoner and all of his household were saved. How could, listen, Everybody say, the world said they were in trouble, but they were in God's will. And because they had enough of God in them, listen now, they had Jesus in them. They were following Jesus. They finished and were accomplishing the assignment that Jesus had given them. Now watch. And it led them to a whipping post and it led them to prison, but it also led them to praise. How many of you with me? It led them to praise. It led them to purpose. It led them to prosperity and an opportunity. The jailer might not have ever got the opportunity to give his life to Christ if Paul and Silas had not went through what they went through. It was the will of God. They weren't in trouble. It was the will of God. Sometimes the will of God looks like trouble, but it's getting ready to give somebody an opportunity to come to the Lord. If you're with me so far, say yes. Now watch this. Authority and power to trample up on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing by any means shall harm or hurt you. Everybody say, in God's will. Moses was on the mountain in Exodus chapter 32. Moses was on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments from the Lord. Joshua was standing waiting on Moses. For 40 days and 40 nights, Moses was on that mountain. Exodus chapter 32. How many of you with me say yes? A lot of scripture today, so you're going to have to hang out a while. Everybody say, thank God for scripture. Now, this is what it says. It says, and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, get up. Boy, they wouldn't have talked to Moses like that. Listen to me. They looked at Aaron and they said, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we we don't even know what's become of him. Stay with me. Setting the foundation for where we're really going. In the valley, Moses was on top of the mountain receiving Ten Commandments to further the progression of the children of Israel so that they could walk in prosperity into a land that flows with milk and honey. But in the valley, the children of Israel had gotten anxious because Moses had been delayed to come down out of the mount. The people gathered themselves unto Aaron and said to him, Up! Rise up! Now this is what it means. Establish and make us a God which shall go before us. I mean, tell you, What happened in those six to 12 days? He had parted the Red Sea. He gave them sweet water to drink out of a rock. I mean, there were so many things that God performed the miraculous for them. Pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. As a leader, Aaron compromised God's standard in order to please the people. But I wonder if he was pleasing himself. That's just a thought. 
This is what Aaron said. He said, break off the golden earrings that are in the ears of your wives. Break off the golden earrings that are in the ears of your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. And now watch now. And Aaron began to fashion it with a graving tool. Boy, Priscilla Schreier, she said something this last week made my stomach hurt. about fashioning Jesus into a modern Jesus. Listen to this. That we have watered it down to the point of where there is no expectation of holiness. Jesus has come politically correct. It's what she said publicly. I was like, go girl or lady. I listened to it three times. And I thought, man, Jesus, I don't want to water it down. But I don't want to be harsh and hard. What do we want? Truth. From Genesis to Revelation, truth. So now watch. Aaron began to fashion it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf, and they said, listen what they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which has brought you up out of the land of Egypt. What? And when Aaron saw it, now this is the thing that gets me, when Aaron saw the calf, he built an altar before it, simply saying, this is worship. But I want to say something to you, and I'm jumping way ahead of myself. When Moses and Aaron were coming, or when Moses and Joshua were coming down off of the mountain, watch this. Joshua turned to Moses and said, I hear the sound of war. Aaron and the people of Israel called it worship. There's something going on here. How many of you with me? Wave at me. Listen at this. There's things that God puts in Moses and Joshua that he never put in Aaron. Stay with me. This is about three or four weeks long, y'all. A lot of info here in one, but we're setting a foundation for where we're going. If you're with me, shout yes. Okay. How many of you want to be a victorious soldier in the army of the Lord? Shout yes. Watch. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. Aaron was calling this worship. Now watch this. This is what gets me is verse 7. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go get thee down. Get down off of the mountain. For the people which thou brought out of the land of Egypt, listen to what it says, have corrupted themselves. Man, where God God began to show me in here. But I'm talking to you right now. Not about anybody, about me. And then this is what God spoke to me, Tim. Your compromise can lead to corruption. Not every compromise is bad. I got a buddy back east by the name of Paul Case. We used to compromise a whole lot, and this is the way we compromised. He'd say, hey, I'm going to be gone on vacation for a few days. He said, I want you to feed my cows. And I said, yeah, and when you get back, if I feed your cows, you'll help me mend fence. He said, no problem. Everybody say, good compromise. Nothing wrong with that. Good things came out of that. Verse 7 says, that God said the people have corrupted themselves. When you compromise, you can end up in what is called a compromising situation that can lead to a compromising position that can lead to corruption. Now, let's look quickly at Samson. A man that the Spirit of God used greatly. Samson was called to be a Nazarite, a judge over Israel from birth. No wine or strong drink, no razor to touch the head of his hair, will not go near a corpse, meaning that he was to be consecrated. Everybody say consecrated. From the Hebrew word Nazar, meaning to be separate 
holy unto Yahweh, dedicated to a divine purpose. Judges chapter 14, verse 16 says, Samson went down to Timnah. He came to the vineyard of Timnah. A lion roared against him. The Spirit of the Lord came up on Samson mightily. The word mightily there means to push forward, to break out, to prosper. The Spirit of the Lord came up mightily upon Samson, and he tore or rent the lion apart. What he did is that he just took and he ripped that lion like in half. Just a gaping gash in the lion. Okay. Everybody say, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily. Judges 14, 19 says, the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson. He by himself slew, killed 30 men of Ashkelon and took their spoil. One man killed 30. Judges 15, 14, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Samson. He took the jawbone of a donkey and slew a thousand men. And when he was thirsty, he asked God for a drink and God caused water to form in the hollow of the jawbone and he drank and was refreshed. Everybody say, anointed of God. He slew a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. Samson had a temptation. You know, because we do too. You know you can say, how many of you know you can say no? Lift your hand real high. How many of you know you can say no? Let's see. You can say no. Now watch this. Samson had a temptation. I know a guy in the Bible by the name of Peter. He compromised with his vocabulary. When they said, oh, you were with Jesus, he said, I don't know what the blankety-blank you mean I was with Jesus. And he compromised with his speech. Judas compromised over money. Stay with me. Boy, when God called the compromise in on me. I'm not talking about anybody else. I'm talking about when God called in the compromise. Listen now, Samson had a temptation. You know, you can say no. Samson had a thing for women. Everybody say strange flesh. Now, listen. Under the new covenant, God's plan of salvation through Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit also comes upon, flows through followers of Christ. Not to make us physically strong, but the Holy Spirit empowers us to live for Christ through the temptation and continue continue to communicate the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not from the defense, but from the offense. Not from failing, but from overcoming. How many of you with me? Say yes. Everybody say more than conquerors. Stay with me. Samson finds himself in a compromise. How many of you ever found yourself in a compromise? How did I get here? Stay, stay with me now. Watch. I want you to see the sequence of how things happen. Samson finds himself in a compromise. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson in Judges 15, 14, and, and, and establish victory, a great victory. Then in chapter 16 of Judges, after a great victory had been established, look at Judges 16. It says, Then Samson went to Gaza and saw a harlot there and went in to her. All right. The Gazites were told Samson has come here, so they surrounded the place and laid in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night, saying in the morning when it is night, we will kill him. But Samson lay until midnight, and then he arose and took hold of the doors of the city gates and the two posts and pulling them up, bar and all. He put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that is before Hebron. Now, I want to say something to you. The thing that bothers me about this is it it doesn't say that the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Samson here. All the other times when he killed the lion, it says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily. 
so it, I'm not saying the Spirit of the Lord didn't come upon him. I'm saying it doesn't say that. Stay with me, okay? Watch. Now, verse 4. After this, now watch this. Samson loved a woman in the valley of Sarik whose name was Delilah. He went from a harlot's house to the woman he loved. This judge is all jacked up. Everybody say, jacked up judge. Now watch. I want you to see this. After this, he loved a woman in the valley of Sarik whose name was Delilah. Now I want to say this. Better be careful with compromise. You'll fall in love with things that's not in love with you. You need to think about that. You'll fall in love with things that's not going to love you back. The Lord of the Philistines came to Delilah. What does the name Delilah mean? Languishing. Languishing. I thought, what in the world does languishing mean? And so it means to lose or lack vitality. It means to grow weak and to become feeble. It means failing to progress failing to make progress or be successful. Samson went from a harlot's house to the house of Delilah, the woman that he loved. But now look at verse 5. And the lords of the Philistines came to Delilah and said to her, look, entice him. In other words, Samson had fallen in love with her, but she was not in love with Samson. Samson was the only one that didn't know it. The Philistine lords knew it. Go entice him. We'll all give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Entice him. Entice him. Now, the word entice means to delude. How are you going to delude him? By getting in him. How many of you listening to what I'm saying? The word delude means to mislead intentionally, usually by flattery. The word it also means to deceive, to believe something that is not true for personal advantage. The word delude, it also means to allure, powerfully, now listen to this, to powerfully attract, now here it is, or charm. Charm goes into even a subtlety of witchcraft. Stay with me now. How in the world? Here's Samson. He's in love with Delilah. If you're not careful, your compromise will take you to a place. You fall in love with things that's not going to love you back. So the Lord of the Philistines came to Delilah and they said, entice him. Samson has now entered into not just He's entered into a compromising situation. He's in a situation now because he loves this woman. Okay, how many of you still with me say yes? Delilah said to Samson, tell me, I pray you. Come here, baby. I'm going to do it in today's terms. Come over here and set your big self down by me and let me feel them biceps. Man, you are one good, I'm telling you, I couldn't wait for you. Where were you, Samson, before you came here? Oh, I was out doing great exploits for the Lord. No, no, stay with me. Watch now. So they're sitting there on the sofa. She's looking deep into his eyes. Samson has no discernment whatsoever. Stay with me a moment. I'm going to explain this even more. Watch. Samson has now entered into a compromising situation. Delilah said to Samson, tell me, I pray you, when your great strength lies and with what you might be bound. How, 
and with what you might be bound to subdue you. Come open your eyes, dude. Now watch this. And Samson said to her, if they, who's they? If they, must be talking about the Philistines, if they bind me with seven fresh, strong gut strings, still moist, then shall I be weak like any other man. Then the Philistine lords brought to her seven fresh, strong bow strings, still moist, and she bound him with them. She tied him up. And he's thinking to himself, no, stay with me. We're all pretty much adults. In here. This going, he's saying to himself, this is going to get good. No, no, listen. Because things in those days were much more perverted than they are now, but we're getting there. You hear what I'm saying? The Philistine lords brought to her those strings. She bound him. Now she had men lying in wait in an inner room. Boy, I don't have time to go. In an inner room. And she said to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he broke the strings as a string of toe breaks when it touches the fire. So the secret of his strength was not known. And Elijah said, behold, you have mocked me. You've mocked me, Samson. I can't believe you'd do this to me. He goes, where would these guys come from? Did he say that? I mean, what is it? No, no, no. This guy is in a mess. He's only trying to fulfill a fantasy instead of trying to fulfill the will of God. He's in fantasy mode and he goes in and out of it all the time. He's in fantasy mode. He's not in battle mode. He's trying to get what he wants because he has a lust for strange flesh. And he has put himself in a compromising situation. Now, I'm going to show you some stuff. How many of you with me? Say yes. Now, how many of you really with me? Shout yes. He loves her. She don't love him back. She's got several men going to give her 1,100 pieces of silver apiece. Cha-ching. All I got to do is blow in his ear and get his eyes heavy. All I got to do is work him into that inner prison. And I tell you what I'll do. I'm going to work this old boy over. I'm going to take his strength from him. I'm going to show you something in a minute. Just hang on. Watch now. She said, you've mocked me, Samson, and you've told me lies. And she's living out. She's, look at this. She said, now tell me, I pray you, how you might be bound. Why didn't he look at her and say, why are you so interested in where my strength lies? Do you love me from a, why, why, why are you asking me? all? He never did, because look at me. He's trying to fulfill a fantasy. He's all caught up in lust, and it's driving him. Watch now. And I'm going to tell you, I'm using that word lust not in just a sexual context. Lust is very broad. And he said to her, if you will bind me fast with new ropes that have not been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So Delilah took new ropes (laughs) and bound him with them and said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson, and the men lying in wait were in the inner room, but he snapped the ropes off his arms like sewing thread. And Delilah said unto Samson, now watch this, listen to this, listen to the charm and the craftiness and the subtleness. Until now, you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me with what you might be bound. And he said to you, her, if you weave the seven braids, okay, he's getting closer now. Oh boy, getting weak. Because up until this point, she hasn't laid with him yet. They're still in a compromising situation. But if he's not careful, he's going to get into a compromising position. Hear what I'm saying? Watch now. 
Can I not be a watchman this morning? As I did a study of Peter, and Peter said, I'll never. He said it before the other disciples. He said, I will, told Jesus, he said, I will never deny you. I will go to the cross with you. I'll go to prison with you, and I'll go to the cross with you. And the Bible says just a few verses later, and Peter followed him afar off. Stay with me. She said, you mock men told me lies. So he told her, he said, okay, I'm going to tell you, this is what it is. If you weave the seven braids of the hair of my head with the web. And she did so and fastened it to the pen and said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. He woke out of his sleep and went away with the pen of the weaver's beam and with the web. And she said to him, how can you say, listen to what she says, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? And her heart wasn't with him. Man, she is in, he is in a compromising, but she does this for a living, y'all. Come on, this gal's good. You have mocked me. Listen to what she says. It, this is peculiar to me. You have mocked me these three times. Jesus denied, or P, Judas denied Jesus three times. Jesus told Peter three times, how much do you love me? How much do you agape me? And Peter said, I phileo you. How many of you with me still? Say yes. You have mocked me these three times and have not told me in what your great strength lies. And when she pressed him, I don't have time to get into that. When she pressed him day after day, it means he stayed with her for quite some time. She pressed him day after day with her words and urged him. He was vexed to death, but still alive. Then he told her all his mind and said to her, A razor has never come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my birth. If I am shaved, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. Then when Delilah saw that he had told her all his mind, she went and called for the Philistine Lord, saying, Come up this once, for he has told me all he knows. Then the Philistine Lords came up to her and brought the money in in their hands. And now, now, now watch now. We're going to go from a compromising situation to a compromising position. And she made Samson sleep upon her knees. And she called the man and caused him to shave off the seven braids of his head. Then she began to torment Samson and his strength went from him. Listen now. And I'm going to read the rest of this. Just stay with me. She said... To Samson, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, listen to what he says. I will go out as I have done time after time after time after time. I did this before. I'm going to do it again. And I will shake myself and I will come to myself. The fantasy is over. I'll go back. How many of you hear what I'm saying? He said, I will shake myself free. I will shake myself free free. For Samson did not know that his strength had departed. Look, no, no, no. Compromise will put you in a position a compromising situation. If you don't put an end to the situation, you go to a compromising position. And it's in the compromising position where the enemy really goes to work. Stay with me. How many of you still with me? Say yes. Somebody said, why in the world are you talking about this? Because the Lord began to deal with me about some certain situations in my life where I'd compromised because I felt like I needed to fit in. Uh-uh. I, I pulled that cord back and I said, I'm done with that fooey on that. And you know what? Honestly, it wasn't anything major, but the things that start out minor, if you're not careful and it's in compromise, will end up a major. If I'm talking to you, lift your hand and wave at me. Listen, the thing that gets me, I don't ever want to speak out of pride again. 
I don't want to speak from ego, pride, or prestige ever again. If I'm going to speak, I want to speak from a humble heart that is very secure in my relationship with Jesus and who he is and pronounce him ruler and king over all. How many of you with me say yes? Everybody say, talk about the foundation. Jesus, watch now, stay with me. There's so much to this. I'm telling you, we won't finish with it today. Just hang with me. Watch now. So Samson is here, and this is what it says. He shook himself. He says, I will go out as I have time after time after time and shake myself free. For Samson did not know that his strength had departed. Now, Verse 19, the compromising situation just turned into a compromising position. She made Samson sleep upon her knees. Sleep. It means to, and I'm sorry if I mess this word up, land, land guard. It means he has become pleasantly lazy and peaceful from fatigue. Go there. Come on. You know what happened. Pleasantly lazy and peaceful from fatigue. It means to be slack. It means to grow stale. Now listen at this word, inveterate. I did not know what that word inveterate means. It means having a particular habit, activity, or interest that is long established and is not likely to change unless God changes it. How many believe God can change anything? How many believe God can fix anything? Lift your hand and shout, yes. Say, there's hope for me. Mm -mm. In the new covenant, you're never too far gone. In the new covenant, you're never too far gone. In the new covenant, you're never too far gone. But listen, compromise still leads to what? Corruption. Went from a from compromise to a compromising situation to a compromising position where the man was pleasantly lazy. She, listen, okay, I'm going to say it. She worked that dude. She wore him out. Pleasantly lazy, peaceful from fatigue. Listen now. And then she began to afflict him. She began to look down upon him. She began to browbeat him. She began to depress him. Listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says that the Philistines laid hold on him and took out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with two bronze fetters, and he ground at the mill like an oxen in the prison. Here it is now. Everybody say verse 22. Everybody say, here comes grace. Come on, everybody say, here comes grace. Everybody say, here comes grace. But the hair of his head began to grow again. Man, when the hair of the church's head begins to grow again, something, listen, I'm telling you right now, listen to what I'm saying. The hair of his head began to grow again. Then the Philistine lords gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. For they said, Our God has given us Samson, our enemy, into our hands. And when the people saw Samson, they praised God. For they said, Our God has delivered into our hands our enemy, the ravager of our country, who has slain many of us. And when their hearts were merry, they called for Samson, that he may make sport for us. They mocked him. They made So they called blind Samson out of the prison and made sport before him. They made him stand between the pillars. And Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, this guy who the Spirit of the Lord had came upon time after time after time after time, who he had slayed the enemy in a supernatural, unbelievable way. This man that, 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 that he had a problem. 
I wonder if he had anybody to talk to about it. I wonder if he had anybody he could trust. You know, he's a judge. So instead of letting it out, he kept it in. Secret. Stay with me. If you're still with me, shout yes. Watch now. Watch, soldiers. Watch, watch this. So he's holding the hand of a lad, and he told the lad, he said, allow me to feel the pillars upon which this house rests, that I may lean against them. Everybody said, his hair is already growing back. And this is not fantasy. This is now reality. And Samson began to talk to God. Turn the one next to you and say, talk to him. Say, talk to your father. It says, now the house was full of men and women. All the Philistine princes were there, and on the roof there were about 3,000 men and women who looked on while Samson was being made sport. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O oh Lord God, earnestly remember me. And you know what I feel like God was saying? I never forgot you. I've been right here with you through it all. All you had to do was just say my name. All you had to do was cry out, Abba. That's all you had to do. I'd have brought you right back to the path. I'd have brought you right back. I'd have got you out of the compromise. I'd have got you out of the compromising situation. I'd have got you out of the compromising position. I'd have got you out of her bed and got her hands off of you. All you had to do is cry, Daddy. That's all you got to do. <laughs> Every one of us got some pictures of Samson in our life, don't we? Can I tell, can I, can I, I want, I'm just going to open this thing up. I was preaching, and it was at a time I was a young preacher, and I just bought this brand new black velvet suit. Oh, it, it was, I'm, okay, this is in the 70s, right? We're all ex-hippies, right? And so, I was getting ready to go to what they called at that time a youth fellowship meeting. In them days, we didn't have cell phones. Matter of fact, I don't even think we had pagers then. The house phone rung, and our house phone number at that time was 7633070227 Eastern Avenue, Taft, California, 936218. And Glennon Rogers' telephone number is 7654474. And the church telephone number was 7654747. What was Grant? Anyways. The telephone rang. And I picked it up. And the voice on the other end said, hey, Tim. And I called her by name and I said, hey, what are you doing? And she said, this is what she, she said, I'm waiting on you to come over. I said, I'll be right there that quick. I was already ready to go to this youth fellowship meeting. So I go by the house, and I get out, and I walk in. And you know, there's a feeling in the air. And this atmosphere, as well as other atmospheres, are created with your heart. Because where your treasure is, there you will find your heart. I walked in there, and I called her by name, and I said, how are you? She said, you look nice. I said, you look better. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. And all the time, there was a voice in me saying, get out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. It's not that she's all bad. You ain't all good. Or you would have never showed up here. Listen to me. I took my coat off. And I went over and I sat down and she came over there and we had a conversation. Look at me. You can't tell me you don't know where this is going. 
You can't tell me that when you're in the middle of a compromise and the compromise turns into a compromising situation and the compromising situation turns into a com- Come on, you can't tell me. You don't know it's going there. How come? Because I've been there. And we're not just talking sexually. We're talking about conversations where it's a gossipy conversation. You know good and well you shouldn't open your mouth to get involved in that conversation because you know where it's going. And you know the information. And you really want it. Your flesh does, but your spirit. But, 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 but you're, you're in the mode of fantasy. You're not fulfilling spirit. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I'm going home, and I'm going to eat, and I'm going to sleep well after I deliver this. And you and me, we're not wrestling over this no more. Listen, not wrestling over it. Gloria Cruz came to deliver a word. I looked at that brand new coat laying over on the chair. And I looked at her, and all of a sudden I thought, I'm supposed to be at church. And I'm getting ready. And so I start unbuttoning my vest. In those days, three-piece, you know, little vest. And the Holy Spirit said, what are you doing? And I stopped. I buttoned my vest back up, went and got my coat. She goes, where are you going? I said, you know what? I'm supposed to be at a youth meeting tonight. She looked at me and she said, then get out of here and started saying bad things and throwing things at me. I just let her throw and went and got in the car and went to church. Let me, let, 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 let me ask you a question. I'm going to ask you this question. Come back. Had I been in that situation before? Yes. Had I fallen before? Yes. Did I know the outcome of putting myself in a compromising position? Yes. Samson had put himself in that position time and time and time and time and time and time and time again. When I know, why if I've got to know in me and I know the consequences of what happens at the end, why would I put myself, continue to put, and it says he went out and shook himself like he had did time and time and time and time again. But never before had the enemy or God allowed it to go to this level. Now he's standing in between two pillars with no vision physically, but he's still got a vision spiritually because his hair began to grow. The grace of God came on the scene. He opened up his mouth. He began to talk to the Father. And listen what he says to the Father. After all of this stuff, listen what he says to the Father. Listen what he says. Oh God, remember me. I pray that you strengthen me just one more time. Thank God in the covenant. Oh, God, thank God in the new covenant. It's just not one for one more time. It's for time and eternity. How many of you with me say yes? Everybody say for time and eternity. Call upon the Lord while he may be found. Called upon the Lord. He said, I pray you, O God, and let me have vengeance upon the Philistines. And Samson laid hold of the two middle pillars by which the house was borne up, one with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson cried. Some theologians say it's the saddest words in the Bible. He cried out, let me die with my enemy. I want to tell you something. A lot of people in the church and a lot of people in the world would see this as him not being successful. But if you turn over to Hebrews chapter 11, you'll read about a man by the name of Samson that the Word of God declares and decrees that he was a man not only of great strength, he was a man of great faith because it was in his trial, it was in when he had totally sold out, when he had totally been, been uh, his vision had been taken, that he cried out to the Lord. His faith was still in contact. Remember what Jesus told Peter? He told Peter, Peter said, I'll go to prison with you and I'll die with you. And Jesus said, the day before the cock, cock crows bringing in a dude and aid, you had already denied me three times. That's what Jesus told him. 
But then he told Peter, he said, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith faileth not. In other words, you're going to be sifted as wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith faileth not. And when you return, strengthen your brethren with what you have learned through the process of sifting that I put you through. But Samson's got a lot to say today in 2022. He's got a lot to say, Jordan. It says, and Samson laid hold of the two middle pillars by which bore up, one with the right hand, the other with the left. And Samson cried, let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself mightily. And the house fell upon the princes and upon all the people that were in it. So the dead whom he slew at his death were more than whom he'd slew in his life. This is what I love. Then his kinsmen and all the tribal family of his father came down. They took Samson's body and they brought it up. <laughs> and they buried him between Zorah and Eshtol. Remember Eshtol? In the burial place of Manoah, his father. He judged Israel. That is, had defended the Israelites for 20 years. Like I said, if you turn over there in Hebrews, you'll find him in the hall of faith. Thank God for grace. Everybody say this with me, and I, I don't mean this. Everybody say, my hair is growing. Say, I have a father who knows where I'm at. You know, what, you know, remember what Job said? Job said this in his deepest, darkest trial. This is what Job said. Job said this. Job said, there's a time in my life right now that I talked with God, and I've talked with God and been face-to-face -face with God, and man, God and I are just like best friends. I mean, it was good. But he said, right now I'm in my deepest, darkest trial. And he said, I go before me, and God is not there. I go behind me, and God is not there. I go to the right, and he's not there, and I go to the left, he's not there. Job said, impenetrable darkness is all around me. And then Job said, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, then I came to my spiritual senses. It's not important. I know where God's at. I know God knows where I'm at. Michael, I'm telling you, God knows where you're at. I'm telling you, Bob, God knows where you're at. I'm telling you, God knows where we are at. But I just want to say this. There's no time for compromise. If I take you back to Exodus chapter 32, Moses and Joshua come down off that hill, and Joshua said, I hear the sound of war when Aaron and the children of Israel was calling it worship. Do you know if you do an intense study of that, you'll find out they were taking their clothes off and everything else and dancing and doing all this stuff, and it, it got wild. The Bible says that Moses went to Aaron and he said, where'd this golden calf come from? <laughs> Aaron goes, I don't know. It just jumped out of the fire. Where'd that compromise come from? I don't know. It just jumped out of the fire. Sometimes they do just jump out of the fire. But I have a no in me. And the reason I have a no in me is because I have decided to follow Jesus. And not every time that I have followed Jesus have I said no, but I always have the opportunity to say no to the temptation and to say yes. Always have the opportunity. Always. But when I fall, I know I have an advocate. He intercedes for me. He's interceding for us right now. How many of you hear me? How many of you hear what I'm saying? He's ever interceding for us. So what do I do? Follow Jesus. I think sometimes we get so deep in our theology that if we're not careful, let's just go back to what does that mean to follow Jesus? It's pretty simple. What does the book say? What does the Word of God say? 
about a relationship with Christ Jesus. The Bible talks about many times that we are to follow some of the examples in the Old Testament so that we will not fall into the same pitfalls that they fell into. So, follow Jesus. I, I've, I've been asking myself, because I've had some thoughts. I had some thoughts the other day. When I, it seems like it always happens at the stop sign or at a red light. I had some thoughts the other day, and, and I was thinking, I'm right. Because I saw something, and I thought, I'm right. And I'm not going to get into all of it. And I thought, I'm right. I'm right about this. I am right about this. And the Lord, it was like the Lord said, big deal. So you're right. What does that mean? See, this isn't just about me and my family. This isn't just about me and Kathy getting along. This is about you and Carrie getting along. This is about you and Heather getting along. This is about you and Gail getting along. This is about Naomi and Jason getting along. This, this, this is about husbands and wives getting along. This is about daddies being good, good fathers to their sons and their daughters. This is about mamas being good mothers to their sons. and their, This is about a family unit called the church where we started this whole thing. We are the blood washed, the redeemed of the Lord. Those that follow Jesus, and according to 1 Peter chapter 2, I believe it is that we are also precious stones that we are built into the house that God's built called the church. I didn't join. I was born. I had a new birth. I was, everybody say, born into. You gave birth to me almost 63 years ago, October the 28th, and it's the easiest birth you ever gave in your life, wasn't it? She just laughed. I was breech. Ouch is right. Jock, Dr. John D. Ellis. I can still remember when I was in school, you'd take me by the hand and we'd have to walk up them stairs. And I would always say, Mom, am I going to get a shot? And you'd lie to me. <laughs> get up there. And they'd give, there, was a, there was a nurse by the name of Anna. She was a nurse. Oh, Evelyn. It was Evelyn. You're smart. Almost 90 years old, you're still kicking. You still got it going on up there. You act like you don't, but you do. How about it? I don't want to compromise. Have I ever looked at me? Yes. And I think every one of us have. This word today is to the body of Christ because I want to tell you something. There's a compromise coming. It's going to look good. It's going to sound good. I'm telling you. I still believe in the virgin birth. I sat down with a doctor. Remember that? I sat down with this doctor, and he brought all these things. And he, the first question he said when I sat down with him at a restaurant, at a table, he had all these folders, and he said, i got to ask you a question. I said, what's that? He said, you believe in the virgin birth? And I said, you bet I do from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. He said, this conversation's over because it's impossible. And I can prove it to you, and I brought the literature to prove it to you. I said, i got a book that I can prove it to you. You know what he said? He said, you got to believe that. I said, I do believe it. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe that he was called of God as his son. I believe that he was baptized in the Jordan River and the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit ascended and lit upon him and the original that went into him and the Word and the Spirit became one. And for three and a half years, he went across that area of the world decreeing and declaring the kingdom of God and showing his Father. How many of you with me say yes? Then after three and a half years, he was put on a cross. 
crucified for you and I. Taken off the cross, put into a borrowed tomb. Three days later, he arose from the dead. Sealed my salvation. He ascended to the right-hand side of the Father. And the last word he said to Peter is the first word he said to Peter. Follow me. That's what we're doing in this house this morning. I don't know your name, but I'm telling you, if you ever sit on the front row and do what you're doing today, I'm going to preach my lungs out. (laughs) Soak it in. I can hear the declarations going off in your heart. It's what I'm talking about, hungry and thirsty. God, can you please give us a hunger and thirst for your righteousness? My righteousness is as filthy rags. Richard Allenese. I didn't come here because I wanted to. And I didn't come here, Kat and I didn't 20 years ago, because we were invited. We came because we were sent. And I want to bring Mephibosheth and set him at the table. And I want to cover up those crippled legs. You hear what I'm saying? Not one of us in here has got it all together. And I'm telling you right now, if we follow him, we'll never fall apart. So this word's to the body today. If you're with me this morning, I want you to stand to your feet. Nick Anderson, I say this to myself now, and I have for several weeks, no compromise. I'm not going to compromise, not when it comes to the things that I know. Even when it comes to prophetic words and prophetic utterances, people come up to me and they say, Well, I feel God has said. I'm not saying God doesn't move by feeling. I know He does, but there comes a time when you know God said. He said it. And I know He said it. Today is not a normal day. Not in America. Today is not a normal day. So I'm having you stand this morning in agreement with the Word. I'm going to say it one more time. Compromise leads to a compromising situation, can lead to a compromising position. The compromising position can lead you into corruption. Stop. Stop just a minute. What are you going to do to end the compromise? Follow Jesus. I'm going to get into this book and I'm going to start reading everything that's in red. How many of you hear what I'm saying? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Father. Listen to me. I want us just to wait for a minute right now. I'm not going to ask anybody to come forward. I'm going to talk to you from where you stand. If you are in an area of compromise today, and you have been there before, and you continue to shake yourself free It's what Samson said. I've done this before. I'll do it again. I'll just shake myself free. If you're here right now and this word is speaking to you concerning a situation in your life that has turned into a compromising situation, it's speaking to you. The compromising situation has turned into a compromising position. 
I ask you right now to cry out to God in your innermost being. I ask you to cry out to the Father that will come and He will speak to you and He will hold you and He will move you out of that compromising position, situation. Right now, I want you to go there. I just want you to think now. I'm telling you right now, there's no condemnation, but I want you to think. I want you to, to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart. Allow Him to convict and convince. She wore Him out. pleasantly lazy and at peace. Mm -mm. Just because they treat him that way, I'm not treating him that way. Just because they treat her that way, I'm not treating her that way. I refuse to compromise with what I know are wrong actions just to get to be, I'm not doing it. Mm -mm. Not going to do it. Father, right now, I thank You for Your Word. I pray, God, that You will continue to guide us and direct us, and we know that You are the chief cornerstone, and we know that foundational truths are all based upon You. You are that cornerstone. I pray that You would continue to build this spiritual house. I pray that you would continue to put in the walls what you need, God, the precepts, the concepts, the agenda of the kingdom. Mm -mm. No more compromise. Not when it comes to my relationship with Jesus. Not when it comes to my relationship with the Father. No more compromise. I'm going to say this to you. If you feel like you want to pray, these altars are open. So right now, if you feel like you want to come forward and just kneel for a minute, I want you to come. These altars are open. These altars represent a meeting place with God. If you want to come, I want you to come right now. 